All right, guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 157, featuring the first part of a brand new interview series with Mr. David Warhol. Now, David is a pioneer in the field of game audio, but he's also instrumental in the history of the Intellivision platform. Uh, so in this first part of the interview, we focus in on that platform, the history of it, David's contributions, and much, much more, including the Crash Christmas of 1983. Lots of great stuff, so without further ado, here is Mr. David Warhol. All right, folks, I am here with the maestro of game audio, Mr. Dave Warhol. He is credited with over 100 games. He's got a resume that uh, covers machines like the Intellivision, the C64, the Atari 8-bits, uh, the Amiga, <laughs> the PC, pretty much everything. Uh, he's the president of Real Time Associates and the founder of MVG, uh, Music Video Games. Uh, probably all you guys need to know is that this is the guy that did the music for Pool of Radiance. <laughs> How are you doing, Dave? Uh, very good. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for uh, asking me to talk today. Oh, well, it's my pleasure and my honor, uh, Dave. Now, let's, uh, before we get, start talking about your contributions, I wanted to uh, hear more about what got you in, into gaming in the first place. You know, how did, uh, what were some of the earliest games you played, and uh, what impressed you about them? Okay, well, that's a, it's kind of easy because back then there weren't that many games. You know, the first time I saw a video game, it was Computer Space, that old 1970s upright console that wasn't even programmed; it was all done in hardware. And I saw it. I was, uh, I saw it in some arcade somewhere, and it was like. Hey, this is like a pinball machine, but with a TV set. So, you know, I was kind of, you know, impressed by that. And then uh, while I was in college, uh, 77, 81, uh, that's when the home console started to come out. Maybe the, the um, you know, the 2600. And I remember seeing the Intellivision around that. And so, you know, just a big interest in games and, and uh, it, going into arcades and playing, you know, the first generation of stuff, the Pac-Mans, the, the Asteroids, all that stuff. And then when the opportunity came, you know, it says uh, graduating school, when the opportunity came to work in games, it was like, crap, you know, this is, this is fantastic. It's a dream job, you know. So, uh, so you know, I just kind of jumped right into it after college. Now, one thing, I, I was reading some of your earlier interviews, uh, and one of, the, one of the th your quotations I thought was really interesting considering your, you know, specialty, and that was that you said that your favorite kind of game or your favorite game was uh, the Infocom text adventures. Very true. And you had an interesting rationale for that, but I'm just wondering. I mean, this is, these are, these are games that have no audio, <laughs> no, no <laughs> graphics even. So, you know, how, what, why do you love those games so much? Well, um, you know, at the time, graphics were so limited in the first place that by having a text-based games, all the graphics were in your mind. So, you know, instead of having a, a 80 character by 24 character display with a single dot on it, you know, I mean, a colossal cave or uh, you know a planet, you know, a, a planet being described by one of the authors was, you know, was just as imaginative, as, 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 as creative and as imaginative as you can be. So, uh, as, as the person kind of brought to it. Um, uh, and, uh, but I will say that, and maybe we'll talk about this a little later, is that that influence of the text adventure kind of really became pronounced as I produced my own audio adventure for the iPhone more recently, where it's pretty much an audio version of a text adventure. But we can talk about that later. It's just a very imaginative genre and, um, and so when I was programming video games, I was playing these computer games, so the text adventures. Well, let's talk more about this audio adventure game. I mean, <laughs> that sounds fascinating. Okay. Uh, what's a, is this uh, something that's out already or something that you're... Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the audio adventure game is called Soul Trapper. Uh, it's available in the uh, uh, iTunes store. And the concept here was uh, trying to do a game you know, a, a classic video game, but that was audio only. And I do have to credit Brian Moriarty of, of um, Infocom and uh, later LucasArts with kind of uh, coming up with this concept or introducing me to the concept probably 20 years ago. And it always been sticking to the back of my mind, wouldn't it, because I'm an audio guy, wouldn't it be great to do a game that was audio only? We didn't really know what it meant, but then I was sitting down, um, I don't know, five or six years ago with uh, F.J. Lennon, another designer, and we were kind of going, well, we couldn't do an audio game on the PlayStation because it's all graphics or the DS or the, you know, the, uh, these are all, you know, if there was only some platform that was out there that was audio only, and then it just kind of dawned on us that there's 90 million at that time iPods out there. And so we were like, crap, this is a, this is a platform that we could make an audio game for that there are no graphics because there are no graphics on an iPod. So we put together a demo, showed it to Apple, and... While Apple was, you know, I'm not so sure what we want to put this on our iPod, they were 
but we're going to open up the iOS for the iPhone and the iPod Touch, and we want to see this on it. So uh, that that kind of gave us the the uh, the encouragement to go ahead and put together a full blown audio adventure. And so it's an audio version of a text adventure, uh, or else another way to think of it is it's an audio, it's an interactive radio drama. It has all sorts of characters, uh, sound effects, music, and it's a it's a drama that you listen to and then you decide what to do next. It's not a choose your own adventure thing where it's just arbitrary and ends up in one of these places. It's a it's a full story that starts at the beginning, ends at the end, kind of like a text adventure, and you need to navigate through the story to get to the end. And we have a pretty complex narrative, but it's interspersed with audio-based mini games. And the best example I have of that would be like you're chasing this demonic clown through a, an, an amusement park. So you've got all the sounds of an amusement park around you, and you have to go, where did he go? And then you listen to, off in the distance, you hear somebody cackling and running and a crowd screaming off to the left. And then you say, oh, he's on the left. And so you have to kind of follow him through the amusement park, and it randomly chooses which way you go. And if you follow him three or four times successfully, you get to the next place. But if you lose him in the crowd, you kind of have to go back in the story and try to track him down again until you you work your way through. So we put contextually appropriate audio mini games in the narrative to uh, to kind of uh, let you do like metal detector thing, or there's a there's a couple of other games that are just that are they're really a lot of fun and that make sense in the context of the story. So uh, so it's obviously a, a genre I'm really passionate about. But I got out I got into it so early that there weren't really any good price points uh, for premium software in the iTunes store and and uh, didn't make my sales numbers that I wanted to. It's something that I'd really like to revive. But I got to kind of look at the business case for it to get some more out there. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Is it, I hope it's still available. I hope. Right? Yes, it's still available. You can get well, the. First... You just made it. We just made one sale. <laughs> <laughs> you can get the first four chapters for free, uh, but I'll, I'll give you two caveats on that. Um, uh, one is that we started off very simple and then ramped up, so there are more sophisticated things that happen in like chapters five through 20, uh, 28 or whatever it is um, than there are in the first four chapters, but you get a feel for the genre. And the second thing is that I didn't, at the time, it was so early on, I didn't give it a good tutorial mode. So I'm knocking myself because my mom can't play this game. Now, had I mar test marketed it, you know, I was selling it to audiophiles who had played text adventures and so knew exactly how to play from the, from the get-go. But the iTunes store is much more casual, as I now come to know. So had I let my mom play test it, I would have recognized, oh crap, uh, there's some interface issues, or you know, I need an easier learning curve to get people in on it. Um, so, so, uh, but, uh, but, yeah, if you're a gamer, then it's pretty easy to kind of follow through. You probably thought about this before, obviously, but you know, this seems like a perfect thing for people that uh, are blind. Um, it is, except the interface does change based on the on the uh, puzzle. So you do need to see the interface, and uh, we thought about retrofitting it for. Um, uh, visually impaired people, but I didn't think the number of units we would sell would cover the engineering costs. But in future, uh, in future products, we'll build that in from day one so that it'll be uh, it'll be easier to do. All right, let's talk then about your in television work. I know you got some. I want to get into some uh, specific titles here in a minute, but you know, first I just want to know how did you end up there, and uh, what kind of environment was it like? I mean, this is right after the dawn, right, of the yeah. uh, commercial video games industry. Yeah. Um, well, um, I got there. Uh, I was after I graduated from um, from college, I graduated with a degree in music composition from Pomona College. And I was fortunate enough to work for the college for a year after I graduated um, in their computer center. And while I was working there, um, we got a uh, the career uh, the career office got a notice um, from a from another alumni, Don Daglo. Okay, who uh, also went to Pomona College, and he was working at Mattel at the time, and he sent a notice to the college saying, um, hey, we're looking for people to come join us at Mattel. Will you post this for the graduating seniors? And so it came across my desk at the computer center, and I went, post it for graduating seniors? Are you kidding? I'm going to apply for this. So, uh, so, uh, so I got in because Don uh, reached out to his alma mater uh, to look for people, and that's how I heard about the position. And then uh, maybe it was my background in music or whatever that, that um, uh, led them to bring me in and my enthusiasm for games in general. And incidentally, I mean, we did post that uh, we did post that uh, job. And, and another uh, alumni from Pomona College, Eddie Dombrower, also got a job at Mattel uh, based on Don's reaching out to the school. 
Now, as far as what it was like to work there, it was just, you know, uh, it was the, the, the dawn of the environment, uh, the dawn of the, the era. And I mean, we were in a cube farm. If you see the scene in the first Tron movie where the, you're looking out at a cube, you know, all these cubes, that's kind of that's kind of what it was. We didn't have enough hardware for everybody to develop the game. So you'd end up working at your own workstation for a couple of hours, working on a routine, and then you'd have to go to a communal area to <clears throat> run your code and uh, debug it and kind of go back and forth that way. Eventually, they, they had more development systems. Um, and uh, it was very collaborative. Um, and, and I'll say that it, it, a lot of crazy stuff going on. The, the people, the Mattel managers hired a bunch of creative people as opposed to a bunch of technology-driven people because they wanted the creativity in the product. So that was, I, I do got to hand it to them for making that decision. So there were a lot of really wacky things happening in the, in the, uh, on the floor, uh, at least in our group. Um, uh, but, but another thing that, that dawns on me about the games of that era, there were so few assets to connect that it was really all about the gameplay. Uh, the, there was so little memory, you know, we're making games that were 4k, 8k, you know, bytes, um, that, and, that you couldn't have a lot of graphics. So you ended up playing the game and then tuning it and playing it some more and tuning it, and playing it some more. So, so, uh, you know, as games, uh, as storage became more and more available and people are throwing in more and more assets, kind of like now, you know, a, a game, geez, I, I, I wouldn't know if it's 50%, 75% asset production and at most, you know, 20, 25% tuning. And it was really the other way around um, at Mattel because, you know, when you bought one of those games, you had to be able to play it for hour after hour after hour after hour. So I know they were all very, you know, primitive mechanics and maybe the first time uh, interpretation of some of these things in the in the home environment. But, um, but yeah, the, so the team was, you know, we would sit around and play games, you know, do a build and then play, 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 play. What do you think is good? What do you think is good? And, and, and go from there. This is a blast. It almost sounds like what you're saying is, while there's been this evolution in graphics and audio and, and that sort of thing, it's actually been a devolution in terms of gameplay. Well, I would say uh, only in terms of the total percentage of time spent in the development effort. You know, I still think games are more fun and engaging now, but, you know, you've got a lot, you know, got a lot of people, got a lot of history, a lot of more mechanics that are available. Um, so I'm, I'm not complaining about the current generation of games, but I'm saying that as a proportion... Um, you, we spent a lot more time on the tuning relative to the other aspect, aspects of production. All right, Dave, so let's talk about your first game, uh, Mind Strike. Now, this is one that's, as soon as I started reading about this, I just got more and more interested in the development of this thing. It's uh, considered one of the best games of the system. Uh, Three-dimensional space chess uh, utilizing the a, a keyboard component to program <laughs> the, uh, your opponent in the game. I mean, wow! You know, tell, tell me everything there is to know okay. about Mind Strike. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, Mind Strike, my first game. And when I got to Mattel, um, they wanted me to train. And it was like, just uh, do something for a couple of weeks. And so um, uh, I was a big fan of uh, the game Stratego growing up as a kid. And so uh, I, I just had this notion of what happens if you were playing a Stratego-like game, but you could play at the same time instead of taking turns. So, you know... As I was familiarizing myself with the system, I just started programming boards and pieces and then and, and stuff like that. And it was probably after a month that uh, my my development project, they were like looking at it and going, "Hey, well, this this could turn itself into a game." And so I wrote a formal proposal, and it got approved to to be a be a full full blown game. Now, high concept really is as I describe it to people. Imagine playing chess if uh, if you didn't have to take turns or checkers if you didn't have to take turns, because all the pieces are really the same type. There's no special moves. Checkers, but you don't have to take turns. But the more powerful pieces move slowly, and the weak pieces move quickly. And so if you, you can commit to making a very powerful move that takes you eight seconds, or else you can make a lot of weak moves. And then, and then better yet, you can break the pieces apart and then move them and recombine them. So a powerful piece can become vulnerable, but it can move farther and faster uh, and then you can recombine it to be a powerful piece. So it's a little, you know, trade off of three or four, uh, three or four things. So uh, developed that. It took about three months to program, uh, design, get all the graphics in there, and then. Uh, but we didn't have enough.
titles for the keyboard component. Um, it was a it was a, a peripheral that Mattel was pushing, and so the the managers decided, well, this is kind of a computery kind of game. Let's require the keyboard component for it. So, from my point of view, all the com- all the keyboard component did was make it reach a smaller audience because it didn't really need the keyboard. Uh, but we use that to allow you to change the computer variables. If you're playing against the computer, um, we we could make it, you know, I had, I don't know, eight or ten variables in how it was assessing the board, and uh, and you could tweak those to just kind of make a custom computer player. But, um, uh, so, you know, that's, that's kind of the story of the, uh, of the game. And one of my favorite moments of Mattel is like walking down the hallway and then hearing five or six cubicles over, somebody was playing my game and it was like, wow, that's, you know, when I get game designers playing this thing, I, you know, that was, that was probably the best day at Mattel I ever had. I mean, it sounds like what you invented was the, the real time strategy game. Uh, Don Daglow will take credit for doing that with Utopia. Um, and this one is more of a, you know, I haven't really seen a lot of games like this. It, I suppose it is real time. Stra- well, it's, it would be a player versus player real time strategy yeah, I never made that connection, but you know, I'd have to look at an earlier version of Star. I, I wouldn't take credit for it, of course, but uh, it, there are probably some similarities there. It, it is a real-time strategy, but it's abstract. There's no story. It's just like chess or checkers, you know. Well, you don't need that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you'd mentioned that it utilized this uh, keyboard component, and I had a guest on uh, earlier called uh, her name to Janelle Jakeways, and uh, she had worked did some work on the Coleco Atom. And you know, she described these keyboards like every uh, game console is trying to introduce these uh, keyboard, uh, you know, peripherals, add-ons, and they, she she said they were cursed. <laughs> yeah. Did you? Uh, what What are your thoughts on the uh, Intellivision version of this? Well, the uh, Intellivision originally was sold with a different keyboard component available. Um, the The original Intellivision boxes had on the box, and it will be an important part of your home computer system. So they were legally bound to release a home computer system. They test marketed one that cost a ton and didn't sell well at all and was really expensive. And so they were locked into, you know, because of the Federal Trade Commission was like, hey, you can't advertise that this thing is going to be part of a home computer and then not have a home computer. They kind of, the, the R&D department put together the minimum configuration of what a home computer could be. And then that's what ended up being this ECS, um, the Entertainment Computer System. Um, so it was a, you know, it was a, it was a nice idea, but it just didn't have enough power to qualify as a home computer. And um, but it was, it was, you know, to that regard, it was just kind of getting Mattel out of a bind of of, of, of having to, you know, uh, release release a peripheral that that would hook up to the Intellivision. Shot in the foot by their own bullet point, sounds like. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, and, and my game along with it. They, they stepped on my game and then shot the. <laughs> You had some disagreements uh, with the management over the game, right? Uh, not just the, with the keyboard component, but even the name of the game, or the title. You wanted uh, Mind Strike to be one word. Oh yeah, that was just a that was just a uh, I'm sure an administrative error uh, where I was I had intended for it to be Mind Strike all one word, but uh, what, by the time I got I don't know it was uh, uh, the the uh, plaque or the award for having released a game. It was in two words, and I realized the marketing department had you know, not understood that it was supposed to be all one word. But, you know, I mean, I was disappointed at the time, but, you know, no big deal. I'm just waiting one day to be interviewing a game designer and have them say, you know, and then this brilliant idea came to me from the marketing the marketing guys. <laughs> you know, still waiting yeah, well, on that. Yeah, well, at that time, it wasn't really marketing driven. They had to kind of, they had to kind of figure out what we were doing. And I did hear some marketing people, you know, going, a game about numbers? How am I supposed to sell numbers? You know, they wanted chimpanzees or, you know, kangaroos or something like that. So that was, it was, I'm sure it was tough for them. Well, let's uh, talk about Thunder Castle uh, a little bit. I, as I understand, this game also had some, uh, an interesting development um, with some disagreements uh, with that too. So can you talk a little bit about Thunder Strike or Thunder Castle? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Thunder Castle. Okay, that would have been uh, my second game, and I collaborated with uh, Connie Goldman on that, who is a, just a brilliant graphics artist who I've worked with, you know, uh, for for really decades after that. Um, Connie um, Connie was 
programming and doing the graphics for Thunder Castle, but the graphics were really her strength. And so after I came off Mindstrike, um, I joined up with Connie to kind of recode the stuff that she was doing. And the concept with Thunder Castle was, um, it was like taking every mechanic from every maze game ever done and, and mixing them in. Um, so uh, I don't know that there was really any controversy with that. Um, it was completed so late in Mattel's cycle that I don't think Mattel Electronics released it. Uh, but that when INTV Corporation um, picked up the ball and started running with it, it was released at that time. Um, the things I remember about the game, it was tuned pretty hard. It, was one of, it wasn't one of these games where you could, like Astro Smash, just level up and level up and level up and play for an hour or two as much as the hockey stick just kind of went boom like that. I remember sitting down at a trade show recently and picking it up and going, crap, I can't even get through the third level of this thing anymore. <laughs> um, so, uh, but... Um, uh, I think it's one of the first games that had wall-to-wall music, uh, where you know, the, from you know, instead of just like at the beginning of the level, the end of the level, or when you power up or something like that, um, it, it had um, it's, you know, as soon as you as soon as you powered it on to the when you yanked the cartridge out, it, it was always singing something. Do you remember the tune? Well, yeah, it was a bunch of classical music. It uh, it had um, uh, the main theme was. Schubert's Unfinished Symphony, uh, the first movement of that. Um, it also had uh, Britain's Young Person's Guide to the or- Orchestra. It had some Mussorgsky. Uh, uh, it had some Beethoven. Um, so, uh, and I had written, because these cartridges are so small, I wrote an audio driver that specifically would compress the music down to its bare essentials so that I could get as much music in there as I did with the cartridge. You also produced uh, Bump and Jump, you know, which I assume most people that had the, the system have probably played. And you were talking about this really interesting uh, situation uh, with the development of that game and this team from the <laughs> uh, that had reverse engineered the, the system. I was like, you, you know, tell me the story of uh, Bump and Jump for the Intellivision. Okay. Um, well, probably around the same time as I was working on Thunder Castle, um, um, uh, Mattel had, had uh, found that there was a team on the East Coast, a couple of guys who had reverse engineered the Intellivision and were, uh, were programming a game on it. And I, I'm not sure if Mattel approached them or they approached Mattel, but uh, these guys were, hey, you know, we, we did this fair and, uh, you know, clear, and we could either do a game for you guys or else we could find another way to do a game. And at that point in time, Mattel was trying to keep a, a very well, you know, as, as all the console developers, uh, console providers do now, you know, confidentiality on their platform and stuff like that. So, uh, so they um, they got these guys to do the bump and jump game for Mattel as an external developer, and then I became the liaison with their team. Uh, so, uh, I, I my first business trip ever. Uh, I got on a plane and went out to uh, the East Coast and met with these guys and made sure they were using the uh, right uh, technical parameters and and um, that they were you know tuning correctly uh, that we were uh, interfacing with the QA guys at, at Mattel. So um, so I got to kind of supervise the production. I guess you could say I was a producer on it. Um, it might be it might be credited as a producer. I forget. Um, um, but um, so yeah, I was just kind of looking over this external development in addition to my in-house responsibilities. You must have been right in the middle of this famous crash Christmas of a, uh, there's some contention whether this is 83 or, uh, or later year, but I think it's 83, right? Uh, when all yeah. these companies were collapsing. Uh, what was it like in sort of, uh, at ground zero during this crash? Well, um, I guess it was it was kind of obvious to us that the industry was failing, um, but as the programmers for Mattel, our management had assured us that no, your jobs are safe. Don't worry, we've got you covered. Um, and and I think the timing of the Christmas season was such that you know they wanted to um, you know if people realized that the Intellivision was a discontinued system, they might not make their Christmas purchases. So I think the timing of this must have been. Uh, done with Christmas, but the managers came to all of, to, to the remaining programming staff. There had been a couple of uh, uh, rounds of layoffs, and there were probably 25 or 30 of us left, maybe less. And the, the, they said, D- 
don't worry, we won't lay you off because we will give you three months severance if we do. And so we were all like, they're crazy. They're never going to give us three months severance. So, you know, our jobs must be uh, sacred. Uh, but a few weeks before Christmas, I kind of heard through the rumor mill that we really were going to get shut down after Christmas. And it was kind of, it was, it was devastating because it was so much fun. Uh, you know, uh, it was, it was, it was a blast. We were able to be creative, innovative, and, you know, had a lot of friends, you know, made a lot of friendships in that, in that environment. So it was, it was a, you know, it was, it was too bad. But on the flip side, when they finally did shut us down, I guess it was in January, late January, um, after they had done their Christmas sales and all that, we, we were taken care of pretty well, you know, three months severance for a guy who'd only been working in the industry for two years was pretty generous in my opinion. And then that allowed me to, um, you know, just kind of bridge to the next opportunity without panicking. Um, so, uh, you know, it was, it was too bad. Uh, and, and, you know, I don't think game, well, I guess some game companies do kind of come and, and fall in that, in that time period, even now. So and I realized not only was it in on the first generation of, of game creation, I was in the first generation of layoffs too. Wow. So you never thought yourself that the industry was gone forever? Um, no, I knew that it, well, I, I saw it shifting over to computer games at that time. Um, when the video game consoles died, this was really when the Atari 400, 800, C64, uh, you know, not so much the PC, it was there. And then a little later, the Amiga. So it just looked to me like it was all shifting over to the, the computer side. Electronic Arts was already operating at that time. Uh, Don Daglow had left uh, Mattel for Electronic Arts. And so I could tell that there was going to be some work, just not in the console side of things. Um, but then that's kind of, uh, that's when I started doing more music and audio production by itself for all of these electronic arts games. Um, not doing the whole, not doing the whole game design and programming and all that, but just contributing to the audio of, of all of those titles. Okay, so after Intellivision uh, was let go, it was taken over by the INTV uh, Corporation. You know, which I, I don't know a lot about this this corporation, but it's my understanding that they actually kept the the, the system going uh, for many years, even long after the NES had, had showed up. So, uh, were you still involved with them at this point? Exactly right. Um, the um, it, it it ended up there was a marketing executive at um, uh, at Mattel who kind of even though Mattel was shutting down, recognized that there was still an opportunity with the inventory and with the uh, you know, he was he, he believed that video games weren't dead, that they were just uh, that, that it was just there was too much crap out there. Um, what he did was he uh, started a company, INTV Corporation, and licensed the product and the inventory from Mattel. And for a year or so, he just sold it all overseas. He was just, you know, getting a, a company up and running that was, you know, we, we hadn't done a lot of business in South America. So I think he was uh, selling stuff down there. And after a couple of years, he. Um, he did a direct, uh, one of the assets that he got from Mattel was the, um, you know, the registration list. He did a direct mail campaign to, um, to everybody who owned an Intellivision. And typically you get like a 2% return on sales and they got like an 8% return. And so it's four times more than they were expecting. And it was like, wow, people really want some stuff here. So um, he had needed some technical support um, here and there, so I had kind of known that, that that this was going on. But once he um, uh, once he recognized that he needed some more uh, stuff, I you know made a deal with him to produce new titles for the INTV brand, and we were doing that for that was probably eighty four, eighty five, or something like that. And we we're doing that for three or four years before the eight bit Nintendo was released. We came up with a, a bunch of games. We would enhance the existing sports lines, for example, and maybe do a couple of licensed things, do some pickup titles where other publishers had created things that didn't get released, like Dig Dug, I think was one of those. And, um, and so uh, I probably did another 25 producing and partially programming and designing, maybe another 20, 25 in television games for INTV Corporation. And what happened there is that eventually then the 8-bit Nintendo came out and the Intellivision just didn't have the chops to compete with the 8-bit Nintendo. And, you know, and, and uh, so at that point in time, after INTV Corporation kind of had to throw in the towel, I jumped over to the 8-bit Nintendo, started developing that as, uh, as an independent 
and shopping my talents around on that and, and my team, uh, and then got into developing 8-bit uh, Nintendo games from there. Well, my colleague over at Armchair Arcade, uh, Bill Judas, who uh, you know, yeah. uh, he wanted to know uh, what, what your thoughts are on the Intellivision system in general, and uh, whether you still have some love uh, for the Intellivision after all these years. Absolutely. Uh, I think it was really well architected. There's a couple of things about the Intellivision that were just awesome. I mean, it was kind of a goofy system. It had a 10-bit microprocessor, not 8 or not 16, but 10. Uh, and the ROMs were 10-bit. I guess the microprocessor might have been 16, but the ROMs were 10-bit. So there are some, there are some fun, funky things about it. But they, this, it's the first video game console that actually had an operating system built into it, okay? Um, it, uh, it, which was really remarkable. Uh, because the cost of games, the cost of cartridges were so high, they, in essence, put a four uh, kilobyte ROM inside the unit. And so then our games were four and eight kilobyte add-ons to the four kilobyte ROM in the unit. So all of the first and second generation of Intelligent games used the operating system built into the Intelligent. It's called the Exec. Um, and so that was, that was pretty remarkable about it. Um, uh, it would do things like print numbers on the screen so you wouldn't have to write your own routines to do that, or it had some graphics compression routines in it and, and some timers, and it would read the hand controllers and do some dispatches. Um, uh, it was it was a, a very very remarkable for that for that reason and plus it made that because everybody was coding in this common operating system we could share code between programmers whereas if we were you know writing our own operating systems we couldn't have shared code quite so easily now um, uh, by the time the third and the fourth generation of games uh, came through the programmers became sophisticated that the operating system in the Intellivision only ran at 20 frames a second and that was pretty limiting. You know, that's why the Mattel Running Man is just like, it's slow motion, you know, it's just, and, and uh, so uh, after a while, the programmers got so uh, familiar with the system that, and, and memory costs less and less to have larger cartridges. So we were able to come up with our own version of the operating system that ran much faster, much more reliably uh, at higher frame rates. Uh, and so I would say Burger Time is probably the first one that, no, the Burger Time actually used the exec. I, I, I hope I have that right, Ray. Uh, but uh, um, Rick Koenig was one of the first guys to write his own Masters of the Universe. was one of the first ones that had uh, its own operating system. And then most of the stuff that I had programmed um, or produced uh, for INTV Corporation uh, had its own its own operating system. So do you have a television somewhere at your house that you I, got every now and then? I keep, every time I find it, I keep giving it to Keith Robinson. Because, you know, Keith is carrying the Intellivision torch now. And uh, and so I'll I'll come up with some ROMs or a development kit or every time I get further into my garage, you know, rather than having that that room there. Now I have I have one in my office, but I don't have one at home. Um, but uh, you know I'll play it in trade shows, and you know the stuff is available on emulators. Uh, so um, I you know I don't have the cartridge library, but thanks to the emulators, I can still get in and play some of those games. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. By sheer coincidence, today is actually Mr. Dave Warhol's birthday. So if you want to wish him a happy birthday, you can do so here in the comments. Uh, thank you, uh, Dave, very much for being a guest on the show. A lot of great stuff from uh, Dave coming up in the uh, next few weeks, so stay tuned for that. As always, I want to thank you if you have donated to the show. It really means a lot to me. Uh, you guys are 100% of the funding. Uh, for Matt Chat. So if you like these episodes, you want to see more interviews, more retrospectives, then please uh, make a donation. A dollar per episode is fine, and I really, really appreciate that. Now, what about that ale of the week? So this week I have a little something called Oasis Ale. Uh, this is brewed by the Tall Grass uh, Brewing Company from uh, Manhattan, Kansas. It's aggressively hopped, mightily malted, <laughs> pour a pint. Comes in these nice pint cans that I always enjoy. Quite, kind of nice uh, design on the uh, the can here. It's uh, actually quite strong at 7.2% 7, 7 alcohol. Uh, you know, pretty uh, significantly stronger than a Budweiser. Uh, so let's get this open and see what the Oasis is all about. All right, so I have some Oasis here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I've been giving it a few snorts and trying to uh, ascertain the aromatic qualities. It's actually quite nice. It's kind of uh, 
chocolatey, hoppy. You know, you can definitely tell this is going to be very flavorful beer. So let's give it a taste. Mm, I really like that. Kind of chocolatey. Uh, very chocolatey, actually. Kind of uh, maybe nutty, too, like, like some almonds, uh, some coffee. It's kind of a thick ale. Um, IPA, you know, is kind of what uh, comes to mind here. It's a little bit bitter, but not too bitter. It's actually uh, quite drinkable. Actually quite nice. You know, I could see uh, serving this up maybe with some some rat skewers or uh, maybe some fish. Lovely stuff. I'm going to give this a three out of five horns. Uh, very good, very drinkable. I recommend it. I think you'll enjoy it. I actually like this better than their 8-bit ale. So get yourself some Oasis. I think you'll be quite happy with that. All right, let's finish up with a quotation. And the quotation this week comes from Goethe. And it goes something like this. Daring ideas are like chessmen moved forward. They may be beaten, but they may be the start of a winning game. See you guys next week. Now, now we have to give it some heart. Gather round. You must all touch it. Oh, it feels so evil. No, don't, don't, don't think about it. Concentrate on goodness.